Okay, welcome to our screencast about um, elements and uh, mixtures and compounds. This is just a little review. We went through some of this stuff together here in class. Um, but we had mentioned that an element is matter made up of only one kind. It's in its purest form, and it can't be broken down into anything simpler. For example, you can't break gold down into anything smaller. Um, you can with uh, things like carbon dioxide. You can have the carbon and the oxygen, but not with gold. You just can't break it down into anything simpler. And the type of element is determined by the number of protons. Um, so if it's got uh, eight protons in it, that would make it um, oxygen. If it's got six protons in it, that would make it carbon. Um, the number of protons determines the uh, type of element, and they're all organized on the, on the periodic chart. Oh, let's make this a, a full screen. Think, shall we? Let's go to slideshow and let's go from uh, current slide. So we went through all those things together. Uh, a mixture. A mixture is a compound of two or, or uh, I'm sorry, not a compound. It is a combination of two or more substances. Again, we reviewed this together in class. There's a heterogeneous mixture. Um, it has parts that are visibly different from uh, another part. Um, and I'll show you here in a second. We also have homogeneous mixtures. Sorry, that's the bell here at our school. It's a mixture where the constituent parts cannot be identified by simple observation. So let's identify these bottom uh, pictures as either heterogeneous or homogeneous. In this case, we can see it's heterogeneous because we can see that there's different types of nuts and seeds and things like that here. We can visibly determine the different parts. Um, and same thing with this ice cream. That's also a heterogeneous mixture. You can see that there's... Um, chunks of chocolate there, and there's chunks of cookie dough, and then there's the ice cream portion. Um, sugar water, on the other hand, once it's mixed, you can't necessarily determine that there's sugar in one spot and then water in another. It is sugar water, kind of kind of like um, Kool-Aid, which we're going to get to in a second. Brass. Brass is a, um, it's a homogeneous mixture. You can't look at the different parts. It's a mixture of copper and I think tin. Um, but with copper and tin together, you can't look at it and say, oh, look, there's the copper pieces and there's the tin pieces. It looks like one new substance, which makes it a homogeneous mixture. Same thing with Kool-Aid. When you look at the Kool-Aid, it's not like you think to yourself, oh, there's the water pieces and then there's the Kool-Aid pieces. Once it's mixed, it's one new substance. Um, this beautiful um, concoction here, definitely heterogeneous because I can see the different parts. Okay, let's move on to some new stuff. Uh, one of the new things that we need to talk about is a compound. A compound is a pure substance whose smallest unit is made up of atoms chemically bonded to one another. Keep in mind, the absolute key here is chemically. They have to be chemically bonded to, enough, uh, to each other. They can't just be put together in a bowl and mixed up. Um, and we'll talk about chemical bonds later on. Compounds have chemical formulas. Um, here's some examples of compounds. Oops, they appeared uh, right there. Some compounds can be like H2O. That's hydrogen and two parts, um, two hydrogens and one part oxygen. Or C6H12O6, which is a type of sugar. Or NaCl, which is sodium and chlorine, which are chemically bonded. You can get sodium and chlorine in their pure forms and put them together and it's still a mixture. But only when you chemically combine them does it make it a compound. Same thing with CO2. You can have pieces of carbon, and then you can have oxygen. You can put them in the same um, vial together, but only when they're chemically um, bonded. They have to be chemically bonded, and then it becomes a compound. Or ammonia, NH4. It has to be chemically bonded to make a compound. Um, and only a chemical reaction can assemble or disassemble a compound. It has to be chemical. There's no knife that can cut water into H and O, the hydrogen and oxygen. There's no knife that you can use to separate the Na and the Cl. Sure, can you break salt? Um, yeah, but you're going to break it down into smaller pieces of salt. But you cannot um, break it down into sodium and chlorine by using a knife. You have to use a chemical reaction to do that. And um, here's a video on uh, elements versus compounds. And uh, because of copyright reasons, uh, we're not going to show the brain pop of mixtures and compounds until we meet together in class. I'm going to pause for a second so you can watch this video on elements and compounds. 
I'll have it on the screen for you. Okay, now that you've watched that video on elements and compounds, let's continue. Um, here's some compounds, some more information on compounds. One of the interesting things uh, when you make a compound is that the constituent parts lose their properties. Um, in other words, the different parts of a compound, they behave completely differently. Here's, here's an example. This is probably the best way to think about it. Oxygen, it's flammable. Uh, people that have to have an oxygen container with those little tubes that go around their ears and then they uh, it goes into their nose. These are usually people with emph um, emphysema. Is that the right word? I think so. Um, they have to breathe pure oxygen. And, and if for any reason that there's um, a lighter or a cigarette or something like that nearby, um, the oxygen is not only flammable, it's explosive. So if you burn pure oxygen, it's just going to explode. Same thing with hydrogen. Hydrogen is explosive. That's what filled the Hindenburg, that giant blimp, that zeppelin that caught on fire in the 1930s. Um, it was filled with hydrogen. So both oxygen, flammable and explosive, hydrogen, flammable and explosive. But when you chemically combine them, neither of them are flammable. Neither of them are explosive. It's simply water. You see, when they're chemically combined, they lose their own identity. Um, let's continue. Here's another example. Sodium. If you put sodium in water, it catches on fire. It's very, very dangerous. If you were to put pure sodium in your mouth, you would, um, you would, your mouth would catch on fire. It would be awful. Chlorine, you breathe just a tiny bit of chlorine and you're dead. Uh, chlorine gas is extremely deadly. Um, you might be thinking chlorine in pools, that's a different compound. I'm talking about pure chlorine, the element. You breathe it, you're a goner. But when you put sodium and chlorine together chemically, it's good on pretzels because it makes salt sodium chloride. You see they lose their identity. That's what these pictures down here, we've got sodium that's burning in water. You've got chlorine, but you put it together chemically, chemically, not just mixing it, and then you get salt. Um, so there's a, a video that we're going to pause, and I'm going to have the link on the screen. Um, it's about burning hydrogen and oxygen, and the lady's got uh, two different balloons, and she's going to burn some stuff. It, it'll be fun. Watch. We'll pause. Okay, moving on. Chemical changes. So a chemical change, um, remember, it results in the formation of a new chemical substance. Chemical changes make compounds and chemical changes break compounds. Um, and they can be represented using chemical equations that consist of reactants, and products. These are probably two good vocabulary words right here you're going to want to remember. Reactants are the things that you put together in, in a, um, a chemical change and the products are what you get. A good way to remember this is the reactants would be the ingredients that you use to make cookies. The butter, the sugar, the eggs, the chocolate chips. Those are the reactants. What's the product? The cookie. That's what you get at the end. So the product is the thing that you make. Reactants is what you put in. The product is what you get out. Um, oh, look. That's, that's even the, the example that's down here. The butter, the sugar, the eggs, the flour, the chocolate chips. Those are the reactants. What do you get out? The product or, or the cookies. Um, when we think about it in terms of chemicals and whatnot, this is the chemical reaction for photosynthesis. You put in carbon dioxide. You put in water, light energy, which is not a compound, it's just energy, and you chemically combine them, and you get glucose, you get sugar. But take a look at this, the C for the carbon. Where did we get those? We got the carbons over here in carbon dioxide. How about the hydrogen for the glucose? Where did we get those? We got those from the water. The oxygen, well, both carbon dioxide and water have those, and then we have six remaining oxygen left over. So, um, when we chemically combine carbon dioxide and water, we get sugar and oxygen gas, which is what plants give off. That makes me thankful for plants. They give me sugar and air to breathe. That's great. Let's talk about more about chemical changes. Um, 
Mass is also conserved in the chemical change. Remember when we talked about the law of conservation of energy, which means you cannot create energy and you cannot destroy energy? Well, it's the same thing in a chemical reaction. You cannot create mass and you cannot destroy mass. You can't get something from nothing. Um, for example, this diagram up top kind of shows us what's going on here. These are the hydrogens of water, and these would be the um, oxygens of water. And when you chemically combine them, notice everything is accounted for. We don't have leftovers. It's not like we can just create something out of nothing. The law of conservation of mass states that mass cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Even though your chemical reaction might give off energy, it might give off heat, it might take in heat, it might give off light, I don't know. But you did not create mass and you did not destroy mass. All you did was change its form. That's the law of conservation of mass. So here's a fun and interesting question It's down here. Has the mass of planet Earth changed in the last 2,000 years? Well, it depends how you look at it. Um, has anything left planet Earth in 2,000 years? Yes, some satellites and things like that. But other than things going into space, has the mass of Earth really changed? Actually, no, because even though there's been gobs and gobs of chemical reactions, we have not created mass and we have not destroyed mass. We've moved some of it into the um, atmosphere and into space. But other than that, the, if we put the planet on a scale 2,000 years ago and put a planet on a scale now, it should say about the same thing. Here's, a, here's another diagram to kind of show us what we're talking about. There's uh, baking soda in this balloon and there's vinegar in this um, Erlenmeyer flask. And then we mix them together. Notice the, um, the mass. It's 38 grams, 38.61 uh, grams. And then uh, once they're reacting, it's still 38.61 grams. And then after the reaction, it's still 38.61 grams. We did not add mass. We did not take away mass. That's impossible. You can't do that. That's against um, the uh, law of conservation of mass. So. Let's move on. Um, chemical changes, some more chemical changes. The chemical changes have to be balanced. And um, it's not a whole lot of fun to uh, balance chemical equations. But notice, um, for example, H2, they put a 2 in front of it. Because here in this case, we need to have this side equal this side of a balance. For example, if we have O2 in a chemical reaction, you might be like, well, how did we get just one O over here? Well, we didn't because we put a two in front of it because we have two H2Os. Oh, so that means we have four hydrogen. Correct, because look over here. Oh, there's only two hydrogen. Well, we put a two in front of that to make four hydrogen. That means the um, equation is balanced. There's a web-based uh, equation balancing tool where you can put in different um, things in order to uh, help you balance, you can put in different um, uh, reactants, and then it'll balance the product for you. Um, but uh, I'll give you a moment to um, work with that. And then there's a video about balancing equations. It's not super exciting, but it kind of explains the main idea. I'll pause right now so you can watch that. Okay, moving on. Let's talk more about chemical changes. During a chemical change, energy can be released or it can be taken in during a chemical reaction. Um, for example, there are endothermic chemical reactions. When you think um, endothermic, what, what goes through my head is first off exothermic, like the exoskeleton of a bug. Exo means on the outside. And thermic means heat. So if it's exothermic, it's heat that's given off. Well, this is endothermic, which is, that means heat that is taken in. It's a type of chemical reaction in which uh, heat is required during the chemical reaction, and it causes a drop in temperature. Maybe you guys have seen some of those, um, they're cold packs that are used in um, sports, but they don't start off cold. There's two chemicals in them, and it starts off at room temperature. You twist the bag, and it breaks the two chemicals, and they mix, and it makes an endothermic reaction, and the two things come together. We only got about 10 seconds left until I have to stop and then put this on YouTube. Part two will be coming up next.